You're listening to Top Line Edmonton with Nick Lynham and JC Kennedy. Welcome back to the Top Line Edmonton Oilers podcast. And what a what a change of direction this season has ta- taken since we last talked. We last talked and we said the Oilers need to get to 500 by the end of December. And then we'd feel really good about the odds because the West is dog shit. <laughs> They're 11-12-1 after a six-game winning streak. One way, one win away from accomplishing that goal. Let's bring the guy that follows this team, rides and died earlier this year with this team. <laughs> JC Kennedy, how you doing, buddy? Oh, I'm doing tremendous, man. The the welcome back hit a little different today, I'm not going <laughs> to lie. <laughs> There's so, some excitement behind it. There is, yeah. I'm uh, I'm feeling good. Um, I'm on cloud nine right now with the way the, the team's playing. With with six games to go for it, let's you know what instead of going game by game by game, let's just do some generalizations about what's going on here. The one game we could really discuss is that Winnipeg game. Both of us were in attendance, so you get a bit of a different perspective. But uh, during that six game stretch, I'll just outline it: five nothing against the Washington Capitals, who came into that game hot; eight two against the Ducks, who have really fallen off as this year's gone on. 5-4 against Vegas, 3-1 against Winnipeg, 6-1 against Carolina, who's a team that's given the Oilers a lot of yeah. trouble. Every time we've done this podcast and the Oilers are on the schedule, you've been all over that. And the Minnesota Wild, not the best game, but a 4-3-W to bring it to 6. What are, let's, uh, let's, let's go about this. What's the big, big takeaway you have from this? What's the biggest difference right now? Lots of goals for not a lot against. <laughs> um, that simple, eh? it, uh Yeah, I mean, in the in the stretch here, they're averaging five goals a game and only one point eight against. Obviously, that is a huge difference in their success. Um, their five on five play continues to be a huge success, and their special teams under the new coaching change has been huge on both sides on the penalty kill and the power play. So, with those reasons, everything clicking at, in the right time right now results in a six-game winning streak. Yeah, and the last time we talked, we were both sprinkling our money on Connor McDavid making a run back to the Calder. <laughs> no, not the Calder, sorry, the Heart. The Heart. 21 points in nine games. <laughs> it's safe to say Connor McDavid is back. What are you seeing from uh, the Oilers captain? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, the human highlight reel is back. The only thing stopping him from that scoring race now is, I guess, Nikita Kucherov, who's been hot as well. But it uh, it is obviously way more fun to watch this team when you have a healthy 97. And um, it's fun to see everyone not, you know, just take a, take a spot in the passenger seat as well, watching him go. You see Zach Hyman still leading the charge and doing what he's doing. Evan Bouchard still playing extremely well in the offensive zone. So it uh, it's a lot more fun seeing a, the, a healthy Edmonton team while these those players are taking a step up as well. Speaking of Evan Bouchard, I was reminded of a hilarious tweet last year from Jason Greger <laughs> when they moved on from uh, Tyson Berry who is now a healthy scratch in Nashville, <laughs> looking for a new home. The question was, would Evan Bouchard be able to do it? Tyson Berry does on the power play. Yeah, would the power play still be good without Tyson Berry? Evan Bouchard, here's the list of players with more points on the de- uh, as a defenseman. <laughs> the only ones are Quinn, Quinn Hughes, Hughes and Kale McCarr. And I guess Kale McCarr. currently tied with Hedman, but five games in hand. Pretty fucking good list, though. No? good company to be in for sure and to our credit we didn't dive into the what i would call silly fandom of time to get this guy out of town 3.9 million dollars you have the third highest scoring right-handed defenseman in his prime yeah i have zero complaints with evan bouchard also playing 
pretty well in the defensive zone too. Maybe you can credit a lot of that to Matthias Ekholm. That pair has just been phenomenal. Safe to say he's healthy again. It's very safe to say he he's looking like the the player that we traded for halfway through the season last year. Um, they're clearly no doubt in my mind a number one pair in the league. Um, and Darnell Nurse also well playing very well on the second pair. Seems like whatever changed with Paul Coffey coming in, seems like that's been the big change in Darnell Nash's game. He's been, like we mentioned, simplifying his game a little bit more. And it's resulting in very good play with him and Cody Cece. Um, this is just a team who's playing really well, very confident in their game at the moment. So I want to touch on a couple of Evan Bouchard stats. By the athletics model with net rating, He's eighth in the Norris odds. Since Paul Coffey was hired, he's got 12 points in nine and a, a, well, this was in the middle of the game. Nearly a 60% expected goals percentage when he's on the ice. 13 points in like 10 games, if I've done the math here quickly. Second among D-men in uh, power play goals behind McCarr. Or points per power play goal, yeah. Power play, yeah. Uh, tied for fourth in even strength scoring among D-men. And 57% of the goals at 5-on-5 five five are in the Oilers' favor. This is a guy people are running out of town every little mistake. Yeah, people want him. What the even, fuck? Even early in this year, people wanted him out. Like, it's just, uh, it's funny the, the reactions you get on social media. As you know in the Minnesota game, he joined Paul Coffey as the only... Oilers defenseman with a 10-game point streak in his career. Yeah, it's pretty pretty good company to be in as well in Paul with Paul Coffey there. Like, this is everything you want from a drafted young defenseman. Oh, absolutely. Zero complaints with me. Obviously, he had some, some issues in his, like, rookie season, but he, no doubt he's developed into a, a, an elite defenseman. Oh, 100%. And a key p- piece of that turnaround, let's say on the decor. As you mentioned this before we got on, a guy that is an easy guy to pile on, a yeah. guy that we've done it to, Darnell Nurse. What are you seeing out of his game lately? Yeah, you got to give this guy a lot of credit in his play. This He's a he's a big part of the team's success in this winning streak as well, just uh, playing a, a, a lot more sound game with uh, just making simple plays, not – it feels like he's not overthinking the play nearly as much as getting the puck up the ice and rather than skating it a lot that we've seen. Yep. And it's it's obviously resulting getting the 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 speedy forwards the puck is has been working really well. I have zero complaints with Darnell Nurse right now isn't that is uh a second pair that has been working really well in this game. Okay, you know what? Let's stay on the topic of deep before getting into some goaltending and forward stuff. And some specialty teams. And some set plays. Uh, you, you have a lot of good juice. Uh, we we got a squeeze here. Let's start with Philip Broberg. Yeah. An o- awkward situation this week. Report comes out that Broberg was given permission, him and his agent, to talk to other teams about a trade. Ken Holland comes out later that day and emphatically denies that that happened. He's then sent down for Ben Gleason. Yep. Where does this end here? What's what's yeah, the whole plan c- here? Kind of kind of confusing to me when with those reports coming out and then Ken Holland shutting it down. Um, I really obviously can't blame Philip Broberg for wanting a change of scenery. He's he's simply just not. He just can't climb his way up the depth chart, especially on that left side that is solidified and locked in. Pretty much no matter how well. Philip Broberg plays and then asking a a rookie D-man to play on his off wing is just you're kind of asking for a lot in that situation mind you the only player he can probably get in over is Vinny DeHarnay who's actually not been playing too bad lately so I uh I don't blame Philip Broberg for a change of scenery it seems like there actually is a decent amount of interest in Philip Broberg he's still still pretty young he's a big big defenseman who can skate well I just wish he played with more confidence in the NHL. It seems like he's just trying to play mistake-free hockey to stay in the lineup, which obviously you can't blame him when you want to stick. But um, 
gets sent down, obviously, to start playing minutes. You're not going to develop in the press box. So we'll see how that goes. I, I'm i fine with moving him, obviously. I wouldn't just... I wouldn't want to just give him away, obviously. I'm looking for someone who can help this team right now and in the immediate future. But um, it's clear a change of senior would probably benefit both pretty well at this stage. Yeah. 22-year-old first-round defenseman, top 10 pick. He's played 79 games at this point in his career. And for, like, a big, good skating, probably you would want a bit more offense out of him. 11 points in 79 games. The interesting part about this is, I think I think you've nailed it. Is he really is a change of scenery type trade? You're not using him anymore to headline a bigger deal. No, which is so crazy because only a year ago he was not on the table for Jacob Chitrin because he, the organization projected he'd be as good as Jacob Chitrin by this year. Yeah, that hurts. <laughs> There's a little bit. That hurts a little bit. Um. But what's interesting here is because of the Oilers cap situation, it's almost got to be a money out, money in trade for an 860k asset. What do you foresee Brubber kind of being traded for positionally, type of player? What is that? What do you think this is going to look like? Um. Yeah. I mean, unless you're getting a similar, maybe right shot D man who is in kind of in the same situation, is probably the easy answer would be a forward. How about a six foot seven left shot defenseman? <laughs> Some meat. We got six six Vinny D R A in the line. Think of them beside each other though, bro. Oh god. What was it? Who was it? Was it Chicago who listed all the, the height on their demon? They had like six eight, six seven, lost, six like, six, nothing. and they got killed. So <laughs> yeah, some of some to me tells me that size doesn't necessarily matter in the NHL. Hey, you um, need you need Vincent DeArne and uh Logan Stanley to go toe to toe with Zadarov and uh <laughs> Myers in the division, bro. Um if someone would want to take on Stanley and Darnay, I would love to see that pair just for a game, but not <laughs> definitely not not in the Edmonton Oiler uniform. Um, but yeah, no, I I heard your pitch on uh, the Logan Stanley in the last podcast, so I'll pass on that. <laughs> um, so what do you think though? Like a defenseman come back or a forward, or I guess it could be either. Um, I would say it's probably going to be a change of scenery of a forward. It's hard to find a right shot prospect in for a change of scenery right now that also fits another team's need. Like, the only one that came to my head right away was the Bernard Docker in Ottawa, but they're set on left side D, so that's yeah. not really a fit there. Um, I'd look for a, yeah, I'd look for a forward. They obviously already mentioned there was the roughly the same salary cap, so I'd obviously hope it's a young player who can benefit on a change rather than a, a guy making like league minimum or neck close to so that's something i would be looking for someone who can possibly get into the top six eventually maybe obviously not right away but maybe a morgan frost that's an you'd have to add some money in there, to, yeah yeah i don't know it's gonna be interesting because it's gonna be hard to make like a a straight up 850k player for 850 that's gonna yeah, like those deals aren't meaningfully so easy anything. to make yeah another d-man this is what i find so fascinating about podcasting regular media fandom what's your opinion on cody cc's year um i really can't complain about it it's it's cody cc playing playing hockey nothing to really excite you for but for given the role that he has to play it's you're asking kind of a lot for him to be a top four d-man but i think overall he's been he's been steady like i'm not gonna come on here and praise him really ever but he's not someone who's been who's been killing the team at all okay so the reason i ask i think we've both come to this conclusion in years past um and i think it's probably the most fair looking at his career Cody Cece is a, a solid third-pairing defenseman, yeah. but we see it all over the league. Once you get thrown into the top four, it's a whole different animal. I think Cody Cece is a more than five, five or six. But it is so funny to watch the local media in Edmonton think this guy's been their best defenseman this year. <laughs> What's your thoughts on Cody Cece being the best defenseman in Edmonton? Yeah, that like, we just ran That's the numbers sweet. of Evan Bouchard and the recent play of Matthias Ekholm. 
It is. It's. Inc- They're shocked. He got demoted. Yeah, that is absolute insane to me to think that he can jump any of those players in play, especially over a course of stretch of time. Like, there's no doubt he's pro- probably been the fourth, maybe even fifth sometimes like, with Brett Kulak's play sometimes. But to say he's been the best D-man is absolutely insane. And if he is our best D-man, you obviously see in the struggles early on in the season. So, Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I just I stumbled into some of those combos and stuff this week, and I was just like, excuse me, what? What? I just don't understand how you can watch the Matias Ekholm and Evan Bouchard play and say Cody Cece's been the best defenseman on the team. Yeah. So you know what? Let's go to the Winnipeg game because we were both in attendance for it. What did you get to see live? And what were some of your takeaways from the Edmonton Oilers being there at the arena, seeing it up close, seeing plays develop, seeing just experiencing that? Yeah, obviously... Decent game. Obviously, the Jets got that that power play goal near the end of the first period. And like we kind of talked about just in group chats and stuff, though, the Jets seemed to kind of just want to trap it up and kind of resulted into boring hockey, especially in the second period, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. Where I always I thought Edmonton was the better team the entire game. Yeah. Um, it was a lot of fun seeing Connor McDavid live, obviously. He... Uh, he just makes things happen out of nothing. It's it's incredible. Um, it was really I was really getting nervous with Connor Hellebuck's play during that entire game. Someone, well, he was locked in. Yeah, he really was. <laughs> he Especially was like I knew it was going to be one of those games. Where I think it was the first shift where Zach Hyman had the the rebound and Connor Hellebuck came out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, but I really can't complain. I think Edmonton played a fairly sound game for. You know, obviously near the end, you're going to have to take chances up the rush to kind of to get back into the hockey game. Um, as soon as that squeak squeaker went in with Darnell Nurse, I, I was extremely confident that the Oilers were going to win that hockey game. But um, no doubt in my mind that they were the better team. They only winning like winning 3-1 is a sign of, of good hockey on both sides of the puck. I don't think outside the Scheifele, I don't really think the Jets generated a whole lot in that game as well. So um, I really liked it, especially with the Jets' depth. I was kind of concerned about, but I think Edmonton fared that really well. Yeah, I thought I thought that Oilers were the best team all 60 minutes. The Winnipeg Jets basically scored and decided that they were going to try and win it that way the rest of the way, um, mostly probably because Connor Hellebuck. Looked absolutely dialed, which I think is what made that Darnell Nurse goal so shocking in yeah. the arena. Um, and then it just felt like after that went in, it was going to be all Edmonton the rest of the way. The Connor McDavid to Leon Dreisaitl one timer, oh, like, oh like, what do you do? It is beautiful. He, he had one place to go with that puck too. Like yeah, Connor, it was Hellebuck read that play. Yeah, it was. Just, it was the perfect placement. Just it was. Uh, it was beautiful to see. It was, yeah, it was it was a good environment in the building too. A lot of you fuckers in there, uh, Edmonton always, fans. It was crazy. Uh, but yeah, Connor McDavid, despite only being on the score sheet for one assist, was making things happen all night. His ability to stop on a dime or change directions on a dime is just so insane to watch at that level. It, I, the one thing I, I think you did nail it too. The one one line that kind of gave the Oilers some trouble. Was that new look Shifley line? Yeah, and it, it a lot of it when it was working, because the Oilers did load up the line in the third, but it, that that Leon Dreisel versus Shifley line matchup was pretty interesting actually, because yep. I thought Shifley was kind of winning it until the third period changes, mm-hmm. and that's not something I probably would have guessed going in. No, like typically when I see the Jets and Oilers matchup, it's obviously clear that Lowry's going to be on McDavid, so. McDavid kicked the shit out of them. Oh, he, yeah, he they destroyed slaughtered them. That so typically, like, I, there's not a matchup I'm not necessarily worried about when it comes to, obviously, Connor McDavid, the best player. So I was fine with that. And typically when you hear Leon Dreisaitl versus Mark Scheifele, you, you expect Leon to, to be winning that battle. But, yeah, that was clear, the, the only line really generating for the Winnipeg Jets. Yeah. Uh, another thing you want to talk about, Oilers special teams. Back to carrying the mail. Yeah. Uh, what are you seeing from the Oilers special teams? With with some numbers behind it, what's this look like right now? 
Yeah, it's it's been awesome. In the last six games, they've had a, a penalty kill of 95% and a power play of 45%. So, obviously, those numbers are insanely high Yeah. in the – in the stretch of the imagination, I obviously figured the power play would be uh, get getting going at any. St- like I knew that their struggles were unsustainable just yeah. with the talent they have on there. For but sure. the penalty kill to me has been very surprising this year. The number being that high, obviously the way Stuart Skinner has played has been huge for for the penalty kill. You need your goalie to be the best the best player on a penalty kill. But something to me it seems like they're just way more detail oriented. When on the penalty kill, they finally have set pairs versus kind of what felt like all systems go on the penalty kill. Almost anyone had a t- chance. And they just – they have a, p- a set plan when they're on the penalty kill, which builds chemistry. We see Leon Dreisel to go on just for strictly face-offs, which is huge. Obviously, you want the puck on both sides of specialty teams. And when you're on the penalty kill and you win the face-off, that almost instantly kills at 20 seconds right away. So – that is uh that has been a lot of fun to see power play i there hasn't really been obviously a change it's just, it's just clicking now like i like i mentioned you have that much talent it was bound to happen yeah. eventually so that is fun to see that they're winning the specialty teams battle in almost every single game now while playing so well 5 on 5 the big one, obviously, to me was in the Minnesota game where I didn't think they played at their best, but they won the special teams battle. I think they were, what, 50% on the power play and shut down Minnesota's power play and went 0 for 2. And those are the games they weren't winning early. No, exactly, and that was costing them. So to see them find ways to win while not playing their best is uh, something that you have to be excited about because obviously you're not going to play your best every single night, but they're finding ways to win. It feels like they're a lot more detail-oriented while – not making that silly, stupid mistake less often now. Yeah, no, what a, what a difference this has made. It's interesting how they're using Leon on the uh, penalty kills as a face out specialist. Definitely, uh, definitely something to pay attention to and uh, watch. I wonder if that develops into trusting a li- him a little bit to become a power killer. Yeah. Uh, well, we do see Le- – sorry, we do see Leon, like McDavid and like Evander Kane come out – near the end of a penalty kill where you kind of make that push and yeah. plus get the five-on-five five momentum back. Yeah. But I just really like that they finally have set pairs like Janmark, Derek Ryan, Fogel McLeod, and Nuge. Like Outside of Nuge, those are guys who are never going to see the power play. So it's good to give these guys set roles on the team and make it feel like you obviously have a purpose being out and there. And part of it. Exactly. So I uh, that is something I want to give Chris Knobloch some credit to. And obviously when you have a a guy out there that you've been paired up with it it builds chemistry and you you have a feeling uh a know where they're going to be on the ice as well yeah i'm wondering if this was a chris callback thing you'll you'll know better or something that the oilers have tried for some time you were mentioning a, a set face-off play that's been really working uh when the team's down to kind of get them back in the games yeah something i've enjoyed i saw it a ton in the jets game obviously being there you notice more things they have a play where it's mainly Connor McDavid, but he'll win the, the faceoff, typically when it's on his backhand, so on the left-hand side. And he'll pretty much race down behind the net and go, go eventually around the net as the D-men are doing a D to D. And while the D to D hits, McDavid's pretty much there in the low corner. They give the puck to him, and just because he's so shifty and so fast, he'll typically turn on a diamond, beat the defender. I saw it. In the Carolina game was an example. They did the D to D, gave it to McDavid, and he absolutely torched Brett Pesci on a turn. And this was a play where I saw as the D to D hit, Matias Ekholm comes down to the far post, and Connor McDavid feeds him back door. Yep. Just plays like that where you, it creates space for McDavid and obviously creates a scoring chance off the off the face off where teams aren't as detailed and you can kind of catch teams sleeping in the play. So I thought that was that was really cool that they're they're finding creative ways to create offense. Okay, the last big topic I can think of, and if there's something else you want to touch on, feel free. Uh, it's been well reported that in the coming weeks, Jack Campbell will get another shot at the job. <laughs> yeah, what's, yeah. Your, what's your thoughts there? Um, 
I'm just, man, I'm just at a loss for words. I think he <laughs> was it last night or two nights ago. He put it up on eight thirty three in the AHL. Yeah, where I saw videos of the goals and they're ugly. But I mean, what really? What can you do with the goaltending? Because if Stuart Skinner played, I believe seven in a row. So it's clear to me that they're obviously not going to be trusting Calvin Picard nearly as much, which. Makes sense. He's he's an AHL goalie. Yeah. But I mean, is he any better? He's no worse than Jack Campbell is really. So yeah. besides besides a move, I think you're kind of stuck because you really can't ride out Stuart Skinner that many games. He's gonna get burnt out. So that's you're not setting anyone up for success in the long haul here, but obviously short term, what can you do really? Okay, so last thing I wanna check in in, and then we'll uh We'll talk about the week ahead. I'm on Money Puck right now. What would you guess the Edmonton Oilers playoff odds are? Um, 75%. 80. 82%. 82? How are you feeling about where the Oilers have brought in themselves to? Well, the stretch I've seen in the, the, what's the word here, healthiness maybe I've seen out of 97 in the D Cornell, I'm, I'm fully confident they're getting in. It's just a matter of where, whether it's wild card or the the three seed in the uh, the division. So with that in mind, because I agree, I can't even argue it. it it's happening. McDavid's going to be the heart. Bouchard going to get Norris votes, maybe, probably not this year. Maybe some votes. Maybe I don't. I votes. obviously can't see him winning with Down the ballot. way those two guys have been playing. Well, he, he won't even get the local chapter voting for him because they all want to run him out of town, which is insane. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, um, I guess what's – we came into the season where this was a cup or bust year. Yeah. Had the dreadful start. Riding the big high right now. I guess where is our excitement – not excitement, sorry. Where is our bar for what this – what we should be expecting – our expectation bar for this team the rest of the year? I, um, <laughs> I would still say with the talent they have, it's – uh, I, I don't know if cup or bus is the word, but I feel like that's kind of got to be the bar. Like, making the playoffs and winning around maybe two is just, it's not going to do it for anyone anymore because yeah. it's already been done. Yep. So I feel like it's got to be cup or bus has to be the bar, but by any sort of imagination, there's still long ways away to be in that conversation still. Um, very good stretch of hockey, but I still think they are a step below on the LA Kings and even – probably the Vegas Golden Knights and probably yeah, Dallas at the, yeah. at, in this stage st- still. But um, I am still – I am optimistic now once when they – now that they're rolling. I don't think the West has a, a real big favorite outside of L.A. I think after L.A. it's wide open. And that's fair. I saw – obviously they played Vegas last week, and I, I like what I saw. They were up by a couple goals, obviously – would rather see them hold the lead and not have to go to extra time, but I think they played Vegas really well. Yeah, something about that team this year, they just don't seem as scary and compact, is it the word, uh, as years past. Yeah. Let's let's take a stab of the week ahead, buddy. Um, let's do it. Oilers playing right now against New Jersey. Practically just started. Yeah, legit just started. 0-0 zero, zero in the first period. W- who are we taking? Kind of similar struggles with these two teams. I, yeah. I'm i taking Edmonton to continue the win streak. I'm taking the Oilers too. The, the, I mentioned, I, I think this was in the group one I mentioned. I'm, I'm actually one, yeah. kind of concerned about the Devils now. Just because the decor. And I, I'm a huge, I had some, Simon Nemich number one in that draft. I'm a big Simon Nemich guy. Luke Hughes obviously has had a fantastic rookie year, but they are asking two rookies to carry a decor now, and yeah, that's a big ask. It's Vitek Vantex looked absolutely god awful. He doesn't look any better. Like they, uh, they're in a tough spot. Obviously, you, I love their forward group. Like you touched on, I also I'm very high on their prospects. You just lose such a high caliber D man in Dougie Hamilton. You're asking for a lot on these young players. Um, much like maybe Edmonton right now, I think they're going to be fine and get into the playoffs. Yeah. But as that Stanley Cup pedigree team, I think you got to take a, a step down on on the New Jersey Devils for this year anyway. And their fans told me they didn't need Connor Hellebuck. Yeah, it's uh, 
Funny. It's crazy you see teams, Carbon obviously bitch. like Vegas, who <laughs> found goalies out of nothing and it and made it work. But um, you're just asking for a lot, trying to find a a lesser name goalie and hope for the best. It is clear goalies can be voodoo. We're seeing it in Cam Talbot right now, mind yeah. you. That's just such a good. What a year team. he's having. He's been great. But yeah, it's just. Uh, it's funny seeing that when they're obviously their number one need is looking for a goalie now. So, and then okay, so that would be seven in a row if they get that one. Yeah. Tuesday night, Chicago Blackhawks, Connor versus Connor. Battle of Connor. Um, I think Edmonton finds one more, one more in them for the win streak to get over five hundred. Okay, I I got Edmonton beating Chicago. They, sh- it is what it is. Yeah, and then <laughs> we got Thursday in Tampa. It feels like kind of like the same with Carolina to me. Tampa's Some such a coin Tampa. flip team. This it year, is, man. but I mean, they're not going to win forever. I think I'm going to take Tampa in this one. Okay, so I'm going to take the Oilers to make it nine, but then they're going to lose to Florida on Saturday at home. So okay, I got them on a two game loser because I think okay. they're going to lose to Florida as well. I'm curious to see how this plays out because yeah, it's this seems set up to be the week. Where they can not only get above five hundred, possibly build <laughs> what off an of being a roller coaster so far. Eh? <laughs> this NHL season as a whole has been it really has weird. Been, yeah, really weird. Looking forward to it though. <laughs> I'm enjoying following it. I'm enjoying talking about it every week. Yeah, and I'm curious to see where it goes. So let's see what our, where another week takes us. Probably our last week before Christmas. If I if I got the dates right here. It's four we're getting close Christmas. to it anyway. Yeah, yeah. fuck, we're almost at <laughs> Christmas, flying, eh? man. Better start doing some shopping. Yeah, Sheesh. Same here. <laughs> yeah, fuck. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. We'll be back to see how far this Oilers win streak goes. Looking forward to it. This has been a Top Line Media production.